this one here, you see this here, so that one mutes these and those, just again to activate it back up again. I'm taking audio from the microphone here, um, this one which is around here, um, but if you want to pop one of those around your neck, that outputs... No, I, I've got a piece of paper here with my computer, I don't know. We definitely don't want to do that then. Okay, so we can leave the... No, no, that will pick me up from here. Those pick you up, or as I say, you could hold on to the hand. And how do I move the... Um, it's adva advancing using the one there. And time. Time. Because I meant to take 35 minutes and have to do There is a, a clock there to give you an idea. That's perfect. Two minutes, okay? And then we'll take questions and then. Okay? Okay. Perfect. I'll just try.
economist and a financial journalist. But um, he has the most interesting job title because he tells me he changes his job title every time he changes his job. And this is the only man I know who, uh, well, not the only one, he's really good at negotiating both his job and his job titles. <laughs> and uh, he went from British Telecom and then to Salesforce. And now, of course, he's with Deutsche Bank as a chief data officer, which you can tell us about. Um, possibly the first person to have that title in the industry. Um, he has won a lot of awards. He's, he was named CIO Innovator of the Year. You know, he was won by um, the European Technology Forum in 2004. And, and he's a, a fellow of all sorts of things, a trustee of the Computer History Museum a trustee of the Web Science Trust, now a adjunct professor at Southampton, and uh, uh, on the advisory board of Bright Light, the charity he began to home team. So, uh, a really eclectic mix. He's just an amazing person who has taught me a lot about Web Science. And tonight, we're going to hear something you might talk about quite a lot. Thank you. It's an, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. I, my, my grandfather was a lifelong chemistry teacher, professor of chemistry at uh, the university. My mother was pretty much born out. My eldest child's a teacher. Uh, the other two have been as far away from what I'm interested in as possible. Possibly, uh, they, they're both students of literature. <laughs> Uh, the fact that I have nearly 43,000 books at home might have something to do with it. But I resent any such implication. Uh, coming here to talk, when Wendy asked me about this, I, I realized that some of the questions people have about web science are also questions that people have had about the, the role I perform, why the chief data office should exist, what I do. So, I thought I'd sort of merge the two and, and talk about how I perceive my role and what I do and why it is, and draw analogies in effect that you can form for yourself as to why I think it's important for web science. Uh, to begin with some context why I'm, I'm interested in it at all. I, the same grandfather chemistry professor said to me in the late 60s, that uh, from his opinion, from what he could see, the likelihood was that I was going to be in generation peak longevity. That until my generation, longevity was always on the increase. But he could see enough in the late 60s and early 70s to question that assertion. And it made me question everything I knew about progress and about humanity and about you know, uh, why would this happen? Why would my children even possibly live in a, an environment for less than I would? What, you know, what does that mean for the world I, I was inhabiting and that I was going to bring another generation to? And moving the clock another 40 years, this is only a few weeks ago I read, we live in a world today where you have to be rich to be thin and poor to be fat. And statements like that are the kind of statements where we say, before we even talk about web science at one extreme or the chief data office and the kind of role I have, there are some problems that we aren't too good at solving. Okay? Problems that have to do with climate change or energy or water or nutrition or health or disease control. There are a number of things that have been hanging around for a while where we're not finding it not that easy to be able to solve. And they tend to have some characteristics. They are multicultural. They tend to be multidisciplinary. They tend to require negotiation across parties with quite different sort of starting points or not just going in positions, but the outcomes they would want. And they also, uh, seem to be characterized by very, very long arguments about the data. 
Okay, you could spend forever actually discussing why the data was wrong and didn't make sense rather than coming to conclusions. So emotion tends to be high. Uh, agreement tends to be very hard if you dispute the data in the first place. So that was the kind of zone that was in my mind when I first heard about web science to say there are some things that aren't being solved and a need to be able to have a multidisciplinary approach. Right? That wasn't meant to be deterministic or having all the answers. By definition, it was like an, you know, uh, an, an approach that was intro, that was still being formed, that, that had lots of things to figure out. But I wasn't looking at the solution, I was just looking at the problem to say, if people were going to devote time to be able to find multidisciplinary ways, I want to know about it. That's just a backdrop. Now, I use the term mother's home cooking to describe why I do my job at Deutsche Bank. And as you see through it, I hope you'll understand why I think there is a reference through to what web science should be about. And I'm hoping only to talk for 30 odd minutes and then open up for questions. <coughs> Whenever I look at the problems we face today in terms of information, so I'm now looking at it from a data perspective, I start with two primary drivers, what people like John Hagel, John C. Lee Brown referred to as the big shift, that we have had decades of the rollout of digital infrastructure, coupled with decades of changes in public policy, allowing for migration in ways that hadn't happened before. And the net impact of these two has effectively created an environment where there are many barriers to historical entry lowered, competitive intensity is much higher than it's ever been, and margins for people to conduct business have been pressured as a result. Okay? That is part of the reality we face, but it's created a, a world where we have hyper-connections, but these connections need to be thought of as to how we can make any sense of them. So it was startling to me as a child, I remember when I was told that we never had to synchronize time between locations until the invention of the steam engine and the locomotive because there was no need to synchronize time until you connected two places. So the very act of connecting starts requiring synchronization of context in some form in this particular place, uh, state, place and time. Similarly, until tribes met, you did not need the ability to translate. Right? If everyone spoke the same language, then we never had to go through any form of translation, any form of transformation. So <clears throat> when I look at it from a work perspective, when I look at it from a CDO perspective, I start with the premise that's saying many connection, the connections are in places that require greater synchronization. The labels matter, the metadata matters, the ability to say, you say tomato, I say tomato, it's the same thing. Or that the identity of a person here expressed one way is the same identity that I can assert somewhere else. That referential integrity is absolutely critical to being able to form any value out of information. When we look at those connections, the phrase second half of the chessboard has now become pretty commonplace. The problem is exacerbated because of the fact today in many of these dimensions if we look principally at data, we keep hearing the, the statement in some form or the other that there is more data today than existed in all of time before when aggregated together because of the pace at which new data is being created. But new data is being created without certain skills and disciplines in place. And it's those skills and disciplines that I want to sort of continue to think about. One of the things that's changing or appears to be changing is the whole concept of how we relate to each other politically. Okay? The, the idea of representative democracy becomes challenged when you have everyone connected. Right? If everyone and everything is a node on the network, if the number of smart devices in this world is already approaching the number of human beings and the price points are coming to a point where no one really questions 
with, with all the discussion of digital divide 15 years ago. Right now, you have to go to India or China or even Africa to find out innovation is taking place in ways we wouldn't consider before. The price points have been adjusted to be able to deal with those environments. There is lots to solve, but the so-called digital divide is not anywhere near as crass as it was originally intended to be because you know, necessity has become that mother of invention. And we're seeing you know, the, the price point for connectivity is different in India or China than it is over here. The device prices operate differently. The, the plans for how people connect look very different. And the willingness to innovate is in some ways increased because the power of the legacy <coughs> incumbents is weaker. You know, why am I seeing so much innovation in, say, mobile payments in Africa of all places? Right? It is one thing to be told that PESA is actually solving you know, uh, payment of bills or the ability to send money, you know, almost a transfer-wise kind of thing. But when you find out that major companies pay people salaries through M-Pesa, then you know a shift is taking place. So one of the things that I kept looking at is how our ability to form any decisions changes when you connect with everybody rather than a representative sample. And one of the questions I was asked when I was discussing this with doctoral candidates at lunchtime was saying, but surely there has to be some idea of who is empowered to have the vote. You know, should there be some rules about the franchise? And that's a valid question, but surely the minimum requirement, and one of the reasons why I can have this debate in an educational institution, is the, the need for universal education. Because you cannot create any conditions for enfranchisement that are as powerful as saying, receive an education, make that a universal birthright. And as we get towards that, our ability to start saying you don't have the right to vote, whether it's to do with age or gender or social ability or economic ability or whatever, starts getting questioned. Right? It is right and proper to be able to have that in franchising, but learning how to manage that is not trivial. How we engage with people, and this is not a pitch for a book, it's the, <laughs> the best sort of you know, version I could find. Right now, you know, 15, 16 years ago, some people I'm privileged to call my friend, looked differently at how marketing was done in the shift from saying there was a broadcast model for how messages were given to there being a, a participative engagement where the customer has, a, has empowerment and acts on that empowerment. And that continues to change the way the customer experience has become the key, the differentiating factor in a commoditizing world constantly goes back to the customer and how customers operate and many of the things we have to deal with in a connected world, in a hyper-connected world, have to do with the role of the customer because from that flows all kinds of questions about privacy and confidentiality and ethics and morality but you begins with the idea that the customer is not a recipient in a broadcast world, but a participant in an interactive world. And that's not new. That has been created by the digital infrastructure coming to a point where, you know, I don't go into a, a semantic worry about this is the internet, this is the web, this is the mobile internet. The web was just a, a tipping point in the way we looked at human connectivity and interaction and continues to be that. The kind of the issues that start needing to be resolved which are not trivial, the drone is just an example because many, many things that we used to do, being connected allows you to execute shifting time and place. And if you're able to shift time and place, the, the, the feedback loop you have, the way you judge what you do, changes because you have that ability to dissociate yourself. You know, Wendy and I were talking about building names and how building names behave differently whether they're numbered or named. But it is true for almost anything else. You know, you could say that a lot of the history of business in the past is, you know, uh, human beings being given numbers and then treated, being treated as numbers because by definition, you know, when I when I used to call to say I'd like to pay my bill and they say, you know, what's your account number? And I started saying, well, 
I know my name, I know my address, I know my age, I know my date of birth, I know my wife's maiden name. I know a million things about the only thing I don't know is something you call me uniquely, which is of no use to me anywhere else. Okay? And that is the premise that whether it's a bank, whether it's a telco, whether it's uh, a government, we have to engage for some reason according to some unique identifier somebody else gave and they can't solve for that interaction unless we provide them their unique identifier. And, uh, no. and from the time I was quite young, you know, it's a rail against that saying, that's the one thing that you should know more of than me. Don't ask me that. But we still do. But I'm trying to bring it in the, in the, in the larger argument of saying those kind of behaviors, you know, it's, it's no different from the euphemism of a downsize or a right size or whatever. You lose some of the connection that you have by allowing the separation of what you do in time and space and not recognizing the human content within it. The same will be true of, you know, the, the driverless car. And yes, you know, uh, I'm, as you know, Peter Thiel said, I think it was, you know, uh, real disappointed not by having the, you know, the, the bubble car or whatever, saying, you know, we'll, we'll be remembered as the Twitter generation, 140 character message rather than the one that gave the world the bubble car. But I do know that the first time I heard about the, the driverless car. The kind of questions that came out that are still being debated and not just theoretically are things like, okay, car recognizes two cars coming, right? One has children, one doesn't. The one with children has seat belts, the other doesn't. Right? Someone has to put systematically the instructions as to what to do. It not, you're not actually driving the car at the time. But you are encoding ethics. You are encoding a morality. And those sort of things are not easy to discuss in a single narrow sphere because it's not the car engineer and it's not the designer or the customer experience. One of the reasons I keep looking to, to web science in that way or from my narrow sense within the, the bank and its interaction, we need to have data. <laughs> to be able to bring value to these discussions and debates. Because otherwise, you get emotion and polarization, neither of which is particularly valuable to getting to the end of an argument. When you look at security, I mean, you know, one of my uh, colleagues from BT in those days, Bruce Schneier, called this security theater. And you know, right from the start, what we have done in order to say the trade-off between personal rights and the need for security, the freedoms and securities trade-off, has gone insane in many ways, but you can't fight those things again. Just through normal politics, through normal engagement, through normal citizens' rights, because we need data. Okay? And our ability to sit down and say, it's not just data, but the skill and the ability, the numeracy needed within the world at large, the ability to be able to make sure that data is collected in the right way, to make sure that it's represented in the right way, the, the tools and techniques used to saying, you know, we talk a lot about big data, but the joins possible because you have some common key. It's theoretically very, very easy, but when they come from different conventions in different formats, from, from different disciplines, meaning is not there, you know? They, uh, all discussions to do with meaning from information usually say you need at least two things, right? One, that you need to have some skill to be able to interpret the meaning in terms of experience and learning. And two, you need to have the context in which that information was created. And it's the, the confluence of both context as well as the interpretive skill that allows you to extract meaning. And today, we are unable to do that on so many fronts. And it's as true inside an enterprise as it is in a society or the world at large. And these are not trivial things because we're busy making decisions on lots of things at a rate of knots. Because it is easier for us to almost Shanghai the, uh, the argument through. You know, I, I see that particularly in things like fracking. Right? And it's not a question of saying, I like fracking, or I don't like fracking, or I think it's good, or I think it's bad. All I would say is, 
issues like that deserve to have good, strong data underpinning it. The science has to be understood. It needs to be debatable without people hating each other. The polarization that takes place in any of this doesn't solve for it. You know, I grew up in a world where, in the days when we used to call it uh, ozone layer holes, right? Uh, CFCs were banned in the West at the same time as the very companies built, that were, had the patents for those sold them to developing countries. So I'm reading in a newspaper that CFCs are not good for the ozone layer. As a schoolboy, at the same time as I'm told, a brand new CFC producing fridge was being manufactured in India. And I sort of said, well, what kind of ozone layer is this? Is it sort of you know, geostatic that we can solve for this that way? What is the use of regulation that allows that to happen? Should we have banned it forever? But even that kind of debate cannot take place unless you take a multidisciplinary, multi-jurisdiction view, because the narrow solutions allow people to gain things much better. But that collaborative, we need to work together across disciplines, does not happen easily in any profession. And there's a guy called Andrew Abbott, who had been studying the system of professions for a while, as to how blur between the professions, as there is competitive intensity, actually creates a lot of uncooperative behavior at the very time that connectivity should be increasing collaborative behavior. The concept of the web, right? If someone asked me one reason why the web existed, I thought collaboration would have been my answer, okay? In terms of the, the origins. So web science must be about ability to collaborate at a meta layer beyond disciplines, rather than to augment and increase the science in a single discipline. If you look at Uber, okay, you can't have a conversation about business model changes as a result of a connected world without bringing Uber. But while I see the wonders with which governance models operate in something like this, saying, you know, you have very low friction ability to find a, a car, pay for it without bringing your credit or payment system out, be able to know exactly where the vehicle was because of a, the false calling that other car services would have could be avoided, and being able to rate the driver so that there was an intent model to make sure that the service was good, expecting a certain level of car, you know, giving so much of it up by saying the car, the whole booking service must have a landline, and you must have a five minute waiting time. You start sort of almost legislating for what are the advantages that the, the emergent service has, Let's make sure that we force each one of these to be given up. I've seen that played in cloud computing. I've seen that played in open source. I've seen that played with VoIP and telco. Right? This idea of regulatory capture by the incumbent having enough power to be able to impress upon that is not new. But why is that important in a web science talk? I think the reason is that if you look at something like Uber, what it's actually doing is releasing inventory that was not released before. It's not a like-for-like -like competition, and everything that looks like hyper-connectivity, you have to realize, is empowering and enfranchising dimensions more people than were empowered before. So if you look at San Francisco, where Uber started, the number of rides is what matters, because it's not the same number of vehicles, and it's not the same number of rides. Right? The number of rides that are taking place is almost like eight, nine times what used to happen. So it's not a competition with the incumbent. It's like saying we can do much greater things as a result of this connectivity. But we can only do those much greater things if we learn certain things about how the world is changing. The law itself is changing and needs to change because you know, uh, today, if any of you still remember what a CD looks like and you may a copy of that CD onto your computer, you have broken the law because it hasn't changed yet. Okay? Even though no one gets prosecuted for it, the, the fact is that we have a lot of law that is not fit for purpose, as are so many of the ways we try to study where we are. You know, there is a paradigm shift that is not like this week or this month. This has been happening for 60 or 70 years and changing many things in what we do. Right? Blockchain is another classic example. 
the premise of saying network databases where we can start sending process to data rather than and solve for the sort of the scaling problem. I, I think of blockchain and what you're saying, uh, we used to have satire at home. The problem to the people wanted to create an incentive for people clubbing spare cycles together. And the, the, the incentive then was extraterrestrial life, you know, a few hundred thousand turned up. Then the incentive changed to saying, let's have free music, <coughs> Napster and Nutella, a few million turned up. Then the incentive was, let's have free phone calls internationally, a few hundred million turned up. But the premise was the same. How can we get a lot of people to collaborate by bringing their, their inventory together? And that inventory is what blockchain is about. That inventory is what Airbnb is about. That inventory is what Uber is about. That when you connect, you are actually freeing up static inventory of things that costs us a lot of money to be able to create. The raw material use that is then captured, made static, taken out of social use, can be recreated. But we have to learn a lot about what every one of those exchanges are in terms of the value proposition, how to protect, how to learn from the data, where the privacy angles are. None of these comes easily, but the point is they're changing. Every one of these shifts changes everything. They are political, social, anthropological, privacy, legal, financial, right? all at the same time. And we don't necessarily have the tools to solve them. So learning about those tools by actually studying the data and learning how to even form that data becomes important. Okay. One of the challenges is on the very concept of expertise. Okay. I remember you know, when I went on uh, my uh, honeymoon 31 years ago, I, I, we went to Sorrento and we moved to Pompeii and I met this guide called Marco and he was fantastic. He was an amazing guide all day. 25 years later I went with my children, and my wife and my children, to the same place. And we went to Pompeii, and guess what? Marco was there. But he was 64, not 39 anymore. And we had lunch together, and he said, I'm stopping this year. I said, hey, 64, you're still young. What's the problem? And he said, I need to go back to school. And I said, why? And he said, the internet. Okay, now, many of the things that used to be unique that I would tell people, and they would come to me, have been commoditized. I need to replenish my stock of uniquenesses in order to deliver it, okay? So even expertise can get commoditized. So when I read that the Feynman lectures are available for free everywhere, you know, what does that mean? I mean, this afternoon I was sitting in a room where original lecture notes from a Feynman lecture were there, right? Yeah, and to, yeah, Tony here. And today I'm you know, in an environment where Anybody in the world with limited financial ability can have access to all of the final lectures. This is a good thing. But is it a good thing? You know, do the MOOCs work? Is it right that so many people in India drop off before finishing their degree? What are we worrying about, the degree or learning? How do we measure the value of that learning? So many questions, but can't answer those questions unless we have data and the willingness to act multidisciplinary to get that data. There's always a battle between the Pandoras of this world and the last FMs of this world. Do you solve for these kinds of standards issues by having a small group of people, very erudite, uh, ordain the experts, and it's top down? Or do you say it's folksonomies, it's last FM, it's, because both models work, but some models work better in certain places. So there's a contextual, Awareness needed to say which things need a top-down approach for standardization, which things need a bottom-up, and it's not yet another polarization, a fight between, you know, in Blefusku or whatever, between the big engines and the little engines. We have to learn how to moderate these challenges better. And the idea that is inherent in all of this is something that's been around for quite a while which is the relationship between physical items and information. And in almost every physical discipline we're going through, we're learning more and more, particularly over the last 20 or 30 years, but going back a few hundred years, that 
you know, like atomicity and the concept of it started breaking through changes in physics or the approach to understanding, you know, the double helix through to the genome now uh, started changing some of our understanding of biology. Everything is information. I still can't get over reading how plants use sort of fungal techniques to be able to communicate with each other even after, you know, pheromonal techniques to communicate with each other that information passes in places and ways. And again, when I was speaking to the students earlier, I said, if we could light up as we walk around the information that is in the air around us that we cannot see, <laughs> there's an incredible amount over there, not just the things that are in the wireless or in radio waves or in TV or whatever, but as much in how nature is talking to nature that we have no knowledge about. But these are all things we have to learn, but we have to understand a concept of what the web represents in order to be able to say this is collaborative. You know, the sum of us is greater than any one part of us as individuals, as disciplines, as organizations, as countries, as society. It is that understanding that to deal with the challenges we face today, we have to get over that. Okay? Spoken about the importance saying it's not about the information, it's not about the data, it's about our ability to be able to capture meaning out of it, but that meaning comes when we learn how to work together to, to fix what our understanding of the context is, what our understanding of the preparation is. Okay, the, every time I've heard lectures by him and, and you know, like any other student my age and I want to be a lifelong student, understanding something about how from the physics and from the chemistry and from the biology I have an understanding of information flows and relationships and that has become a way of saying that the atom and the bit are no longer separated from me and how I think. So when I think about information, I have no choice but to constantly walk back and forth across that. Okay, the, the influences that come then start in getting to places and people that you wouldn't consider. This is a guy where you couldn't you know, work in technology in the early 90s without going into pattern language and sort of Christopher Alexander and understanding architecture and how these things hang together and their influence on living spaces and interaction. And that was one of my like introductions to thinking about where web science led, that I needed to understand about disciplines I wouldn't otherwise have to understand just to do my job. Uh, whenever I understand anything about Boltzmann, I'm saying, you know, nothing I read is new in a lot of these places. For two, three hundred years, people have been working on understanding. So if I'm going to understand something about how to <coughs> work with data just in my institution, I need to understand something not just about Shannon entropy, but about entropy and why that matters. And be able to do that in a way that I can continue to be an economist and a statistician and still say, I have to learn enough about other things to be able, and this isn't a, you know, a hedgehog versus fox debate. It's saying to solve the problems I'm party to, that I want to be part of the solution to, I need to express, learn, dig into, converse about, challenge, deal with things, relate to things that I wouldn't have to. And again, whether it's the CDO or whether it's web science, I just think that there's a micro and microcosmic aspect to the same thing. Okay, uh, this Anton Zeilinger was like much more recent, but again, this idea of saying the ability to, you know, what information is in terms of the ability to express physical objects and where we are today in it, I have to again read papers, bother, understand, not because I'm trying to become all things to all men, but the challenges I face even in doing my job, the challenges I face and the interactions I have with my family. To, I need to at least know, by the way, if you're interested in that, try this, and then have conversations. And in none of these, you know, there will be a, if there are, I don't know, a couple of hundred people in this room, most of you know more about any one of these things than I know, and I'm not in competition with you on it. My, my goal is to learn from you guys, but to say, this is the sequence of thoughts, the logical strain I'm following in order to do my job and why I think. My job is important, why I think web science is important, and why I think I'm here. Okay, this Zeilinger thing that information is the irreducible seed is something that I carry with every day. 
That's why I'm passionate about information. That's why I have been passionate about information. That's why I will continue to be passionate about information. But then put it in the context of today, my job every day, this world of high connectivity, of hyper-connectivity, has also created a world where trust is low. Almost every uh, sort of uh, authority figure, whether it's the father, the policeman, the judge, government, big institutions, academia, all these are suspect compared to what they were 50, 60 years ago. This erosion of trust has partly been affected, you know, why even the democratic model was being eroded, is the change from the representation kind of mediation layer and greater enfranchise mind for much larger groups of people. And I even laugh at things like, say, the iPad or Siri to say, one way of looking at the iPad is we removed QWERTY from our ability to interact with information. So my cat can use an iPad, right? Couldn't do it as long as there was QWERTY. A one-year-old child can use, you know, the famous iPad, you know, a magazine is an iPad that doesn't work. Why was that? Because that was not the age to learn QWERTY, but it was an age to be able to express natural things. So sight, sound, gesture, touch, as we start bringing those senses back into the way we interact, we could argue that the ability to form symbolic language actually came in a way way and disenfranchised whole hordes of people from the time we created written representation for language. Okay? That it changed, even though sentience, ability to be able to form concepts, to be able to discuss what the meaning of the square root of minus one is. Then you go back to technology and software and banking and say, you know what? All these things are effectively fairly arcane in their own way because they're not physical objects that people can relate to when you say software or banking. And that means the importance of getting communication right or getting definitions right or getting the data right starts getting very serious. So this is where I live, Windsor. Why have I brought it up here? Because I want to bring all this back as I go into the last bit of my talk into Mother's Home Cooking. Okay? We dealt with data like we dealt with mother's home cooking, whether we dealt with it in our personal lives, in institutions, or as society. We had high trust in where the data came from. Right? The recipes were known, the ingredients were known, the data, so the data sources were known, and we lived in these islands, isolated pockets of data where all this was known, and therefore our tooling, our capacity, our ability to interpret meaning and value from that was based on a high trust model. Knowing that allowed us to evolve many, many aspects of how we look at information in a hyper-connected world. However, that hyper-connected world is the equivalent of our eating street food with a blindfold on and our hands tied behind our back and someone feeding us. You have absolutely no knowledge of where the data came from, what it was formed, under what conditions it was formed, what it was merged with, you just get presented it and you believe, right? The early indications of that when someone said, you know, an Excel spreadsheet is truth, a uh, PowerPoint presentation is truth. So, you know, concepts like provenance or linkage or lineage or, you know, my dad used to say the only truth on a financial statement is the cash position. Everything else is a conventional representation. But we have to start learning about the fact that there is information lost through that conventional representation and what we see is not necessarily anything of what we can act on. And now we're going to get major decisions to solve world problems and we don't, you know, our, our ability to make those decisions, our, our digital literacy is actually based on a mother's home cooking model. Well, that's not going to work. So telling people, you know, you're going to have to do some work about being able to create some order from that chaos uh, in order to, you know, when I hear some of the big data stories going around saying, yeah, you're going to make sense out of that, welcome, I, I think there's an easier way, but if you'd like to, please carry on, feel free. Right? The idea of taxonomy, the idea of being able to, you know, we have to go through a new generation of naming conventions in order to be able to deal with information that is actually exchangeable across disciplines. Okay? Uh, I remember when, you know, first Foursquare first came out, 
I love the idea that an API around the service that allowed you to check in and document stories about places created the opportunity for someone to say, you know what, I'm going to form a service for blind people. Now when you walk, you can get commentary to tell you what to be wary of, how to deal with it. So I, I can get you know, contextual commentary provided that way, provided someone hardened the location value. Since the location value wasn't hardened, it meant that what someone had put to a GPS location wasn't going to a GPS location, it was actually going to a label which may be far away from the GPS location. But learning things like why identity needed to be hardened, why you see the tick in a Twitter or a Facebook, why location has to be hardened, how do you have provenance for the accuracy of information in order to be able to build services around it, in order to be able to aggregate data, in order to be able to make decisions. It's not going to happen until we start learning those disciplines. That's part of what I consider my role. You know, classification and order, I still remember David Weinberg telling me the story of the US Library of Congress, that the top level domain they chose was based around the number of books in the English language published from that geography. So Luxembourg apparently had the same domain as Australasia at the point when the Library of Congress was formed. But once you get that wrong, it destroys your ability to manage for years and years. So the small pieces, loosely joined argument, the folksonomies, the tagging, that was to solve problems that were caused through a structural weakness earlier. But these are again uh, routine skills, disciplines that are not really being practiced anymore. Curation becomes more and more critical, and you know, I was very pleased to know that somebody else I have a lot of time for, Howard Rango, you know, spends a lot of time getting people to understand, and again, this is free to air. We need to build these disciplines within us in order to participate as web science citizens in a way, because it is by definition multidisciplinary. We need to know enough about these other disciplines to be able to add value. The need to bring it all back to science is always there. This is not web something, it's web science. And, and the, the reliance on the science is saying it's not just the data, it's building the theories, it's being able to provide evidence and to be able to recreate that evidence independently. These are not trivial things. Right? But over the last 10 years, I've probably read more reports than I care to, to acknowledge where the science is wrong, <laughs> where the ability to actually replicate has been proven to be weak. Again, we have to learn because the decisions that we have left to take, which are multi-generational, multilingual, multicultural, these are not trivial decisions. They affect whether my children or my, I know I'm, I'm a grandfather. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm a proud grandfather, I'm you know, uh, ecstatic about it, but I would like to imagine a world where that grandchild has a better life than I do, like any other grandparent. And if the things that are not being solved are because we don't have the right multidisciplinary approach, and that it's not evidence and fact-based, that it's not shareable and replicated, these are all the things why the science comes in, and the web is only coming in to take up a space where no existing discipline, you know, the cheap data office exists because we needed something that could be able to bring together all the functions doing the work in order to act in ways that no single function could. It was not set up in competition with existing functions, but to say that it centralized what is common, federate what is different, operate it working in collaboration. But even the word collaboration, since most environments had incentives that militated against collaboration, meant solving for that was not trivial. Getting the standards and protocols right for sharing was not trivial. And that's work that's done in every industry, in every company today. And if we can do it at those levels, we need to do it at much wider levels like society. All that doesn't happen without governance. And it's not a word that you know, comes to me naturally. <laughs> but actually, if you're going to make change, you need to know what principles you're going to establish and how you're going to adhere to them and how you're going to make sure people are accountable to it. 
No change takes place without those happening as well. Now, you can be very light-handed in the governance. You can have soft hands in how you do it. But it's not something that I can shy away from. And for web science to work, we still need that. So when I'm talking about provenance today, I'm going to have discussions with people like look on W3C work on it, because that's the right way for me to be able to say there will be a resolution. We live with OG and stables that need to be cleaned on this because we've had, you know, as Abraham Lincoln said, decades of time when you can't believe what you read on the internet. Okay? And uh, yes, if you know, by all means, look up quotes by Lincoln on the internet because there are many. But that's the whole point. Again, how are we going to clean up the state we're in? That state has a lot of bad data. People know how to game the system. People know how to influence the metadata. Right? And the, the uh, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, sort of Linus's law that is around, is equally true for how we create open data, open government data, open corporate data, because the ability to inspect itself improves. You know, it's like why security is better when it's open than it's closed. Right? These things matter, but they're disciplines we have to learn. Being able to clean up processes matter, because what actually happens through exposure, I mean, my favorite current example is out of something that doesn't exist anymore, British Rail. As the companies that were British Rail started putting their ticketing <coughs> tariffs out on the web, people created and, and you could build services on top of it. There are now a number of instances where it is cheaper and smarter for you to buy five tickets to go from A to B rather than the A to B ticket. Considerably cheaper. And the train providers are saying, hey, that's cheating. So they're saying, well, that's the mess you have in your current laws as you expose them. So there's a lot of inefficiency left in our world. And when you think about that, the reason why I railed on about things like Uber or Airbnb or whatever else, or even eBay before that, when you bring inventory into a place where people can exchange inventory and borrow and rent inventory, you reduce waste, okay? And waste is something we all have to consider because the underlying cost for everything built new, you know, the Patagonia type principle to say you only buy it once. You know, I was born and brought up in Calcutta. You, you've not, you'd be amazed at the cars that used to go around there, you know, cannibalized, jerry-rigged, etc. but they continued to work. This idea of throw things away at the first possibility, build for obsolescence, right? These were anathema. And it's not things that this world can carry on with. But we're not going to solve it again without data, without facts, without being able to argue our case, I hope with some passion, but without the wrong emotion. Insights, you know, all this talk about big data, sort of saying, well, garbage in, garbage out, never changed. Okay? If you want to continue down the route to say you will work very, very hard in order to extract a little value from a lot of garbage when a little bit of, you know, of the, the block and tackle work of cleaning the data before you started analyzing it could be worth it. I'm in the block and tackle school. There are some things that aren't worth doing that because they were unstructured to begin with and they don't have the kind of rules. But to have to throw a lot of structured data into a data lake is just good for storage windows. Okay? It's not something that I'm going to want to pay from a pure analytics perspective because we want to find the patterns that could not be found otherwise rather than to cover for somebody else's historical laziness. Obviously, that creates a lot of issues to do with uh, privacy. And issues for that, you know, the idea, I mean, the last couple of sessions I've had with Wendy in different parts of the world, a lot of it has had to do with the implications for public good and private harm, the asymmetry of many of the things we're going to face, whether it's to do with healthcare or traffic or <laughs> climate change, etc., because the very sensors and actuators we all represent. In order for us to be able to share that information, we need to solve for that. You know, how can we share it safely, securely, in a way that people can't take advantage of us? How do we sort of advise and influence people on that? Again, it goes back to data. The security issues are already, you know, extreme, but maybe we're not dealing with a practical problem. Maybe we have to look rather than at the perimeter-based approaches of the past to say there is an entitlement model that connects individuals with data elements, with devices, and some way of authorizing each just for the event or the task. Even today, 
I saw you know, a blurb of an app I downloaded to say the idea of the burner form has now become software that I can put onto my device to select a one-off number to send somebody else a message which then acts like a Vine or Snapchat and disappears within a pre-arranged time. Right? Now, those sort of changes when hardware switches to software for that kind of ingenuity also causes huge problems if you want to track someone where suddenly if I now have to deal with a, a money laundering issue or I need to protect someone's data and make sure that you know the entitlement model is right, then every form of spoofing is another challenge. So these don't go away, but we need facts, we need data. The idea of the closed systems of the past, and I did mean to get exactly that graphic, okay, uh, we need to understand that there are many places where open data, open corporate data, open government data need, is needed, but with the right protections, with the right incentives, with the right cleansing, because we need that to solve problems we couldn't solve before. Well, that was why I wanted to talk about Mother's Home Cooking. I felt that culturally we were in, at a trust environment to do with data which was wholly in, inappropriate for the world we live in that we needed to learn about dealing with street food and we need to learn about it in a way that we all appreciated, we had to understand the data sources, the contents, the conditions under which they were formed, how they were merged together. When you see something presented to you as part of an argument, you had to go over the he would say that wouldn't he test. And we had to have enough understanding on it. And so, to end, there was a, well, it doesn't matter, but the, the end I hoped for which failed. Nothing happening? Um, I can come up and have a look. Do you want me to have a look? No, don't worry. No. I can do it. I wanted to end with uh, a little snippet from the trailer to Martian, where there's a point in time where the phrase, I'm going to have to science the shit out of this happens. <laughs> I think the state we are in the world, we're going to have to web science the shit out of this. Okay? <laughs> if you believe that there are problems that remain to be solved, please let's work together to web science the shit out of this. Thank you. I mean, if you look at what we formed as global institutions in response to the two world wars, my personal perception is a lot of them are no longer fit for purpose for the kind of problems we face today. That's just an assertion. I'm not providing data against that other than reading the daily papers. That when I select topics like climate change or the uh, 
nutrition or you know the argument about fat versus sugar or the importance of water or our ability to deal with uh, disease control, each of which is not currently looking like it's been solved. These are issues that have been around for a while. If I take something as simple as climate change, then understanding that if I go for a per capita view on the carbon footprint, I would get a completely different story from an India or a China than if I look at an absolute view. And that neither is by itself necessarily a sensible way of continuing the conversation, but the attempt to get agreement across different groups of people collecting data in different ways on the same topic and actually selecting the data quite often for the purpose that they would like to fight for, we need to find some objectivity across this. And it's not just saying I would want uh, the data if I look at climate change just from a narrow group of disciplines on it because once you start looking at the, the different stakeholders in that kind of argument, you will land up knowing that what you're trying to solve is across uh, a much more nuanced issue than just the simple question on say, you know, is it man-made or not? What steps can we take? Is there, you know, the effect of uh, acceleration or over what scale? And the kind of things that mattered to me was even, even the accident of discovery of saying that ships captain's logs were being able to give us historical information on climate because for them their lives depended on it and there were more and more sources to be able to go back and say what was the perceived climate conditions in an earlier time being able to go through those kind of discussions wouldn't happen if we allowed just the politicians to be able to deal but there were three elements to that i know it's a long answer you know, one saying the data has to come from more than one discipline. Two, the data has to cross jurisdiction and culture. Three, there has to be some basis for people be, to be able to compare without saying I am right, you are wrong. These are all things that web science can teach us to do by learning how to bring data sets from different disciplines together, built in different conditions, allowing us to learn about the conventions under which they were built. Because without those, we go into the emotion first, rather than understanding the differences. But I'm just, that's a single narrow answer. I'm not, to, you know, if we had a whole pile of things already solved, then we'd be dealing with well-baked examples. Web science is what, six years old now? Ten. No. Ten, nine. Right? <laughs> the, it, the, it, the, the need for it, is what I'm arguing about rather than to say it has solved. And the conditions I'm trying to, to, to believe for, and there is a level of optimism in that, is those three. That it's multidisciplinary in terms of its source, so we need to have ways of engaging. But I see it as no different from saying, how do I aggregate information to make decisions in an enterprise with different architectures, with different data formats, built under different conditions, I have to turn around and form some idea of referential integrity to be able to deal with it. I need to be able to expose and understand the models that the data was formed by in order to deal with comparability. So it's those sort of disciplines I'm doing at a micro level that I'm expecting to learn a lot more about at a micro level. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no. Hands to go up with more. Okay, that gentleman there, who I know is Eric. <laughs> uh, that was uh, brilliant. Thank you very much. You address issues of meaning and value. Um, in your area of banking, it seems that much of it is now run by algorithms. There are no human beings involved in many of the transactions that happen. Um, as the network becomes, let us say, hijacked by artificial intelligence and the jobs that disappear, how do you see websites retaining value? 
Web science retaining value in itself or web science retaining value in banking? Uh, the whole thing. Because, as you know, there are many predictions now that, that jobs will simply disappear. Uh, robots are replacing low level jobs, and uh, now there is more and more legal, uh, medical uh, expertise being deposited in AI so that the, uh, the web, the nodes, I'm not occupied by human beings anymore, but by AI. Okay, I, I, I will try this answer across you know, three rapid fire sort of points. One, the, the, the race against the machine or the second machine age kind of thinking. Uh, you know, I know Eric and Andrew, I for sure see that there is an effect like any other technology, but the challenge is what are the new jobs being created rather than just the replacement for the old jobs like for like. And one of my arguments would be uh, us acting as human sensors for many of the challenges we face, learning how to curate the information that we collect and making sure that we can create an environment where that information is safely collected for the right conditions of reuse. These are all disciplines we never had to have in the past, but it's just a narrow example. Okay? We will constantly learn to have new disciplines. You know, I'm, I'm not a Luddite in that sense. And there will be discontinuities. This not, doesn't happen in even time. We, we will see you know, peaks and troughs in employment, but that happens, that's been happening through the ages, through the agricultural revolution, through the industrial revolution, and it will happen beyond services into information. It's, it's happening now. But I still notice, I mean, therefore yesterday, somebody wrote an article about this. Uh, paving machine for setting out driveways with bricks which had been converted into uh, automation. So you now have this truck kind of thing with a, uh, you know, a, a, like a limb at the back of it that just laid out a carpet of preformed brick to say, there goes the brick layer. So I was saying, you know what, just wait, try to do that in a non-flat space being no expense environment you come to England and I show you, you know, a hundred villages where you couldn't do that for a single building. So, you know, like there is a huge, you know, standardization reduces cost, but not everything can be standardized. So, you know, make everything as simple as possible and no simpler. Make everything as standard as possible, but no, no you know, no standard <laughs> is an aspect. So th there is a way to protect and extend human dignity by saying, what are the things humans are good at? Okay, I used a slide rule when I was young. Okay, uh, they were still around. There are people in this room who probably never once touched a slide rule. I had to use log tables in books when I was young. I had to go through sign course tan. You don't think that I envied the people who in a new generation said, this is just a calculator, because those things didn't teach me much the discipline of what it meant was important to me. So I believe in Italy, I am a technologist in that sense to say that value will come. Now when it comes to banking or anywhere else, I turn around and say, well, banks have always been about trust. The word bankruptcy had nothing to do with money, it had to do with a failure of trust. The bench that you sat on was picked up by other merchants, broken in two, your banco was rutto. Credit comes from credere, belief. So the concept of banking was to facilitate interactions with, between people as a mediator of trust for uh, someone in England to be able to trade with someone in Hong Kong without ever having met that person because there was a discount house and an accepting house that could connect with it, that letters of credit could be formed, shipping documents could be formed, ways of facilitating interactions between human beings that you could not meet otherwise. Well, the web is part of that. The things that we're able to do today, allow, you know, how do I count the number of people who have set up Etsy shops or live off uh, work that they would do on uh, an eBay? How do I, you know, are those jobs, right? The nature of mechanical jobs in certain spaces may be threatened, <coughs> but you know what? I have 43,000 books. There's still a business for books. Binding those books, finding the right bindery is wonderful. There will be an impact of saying certain things that are not 
you know, where high volume, low cost is answer X and digital is the extreme of that and very low volume, high cost will be at the other end of it and for sure there will be action on that. Okay, why do I always bring it back to food? Because, you know, my interest is in saying uh, the day you catch me thinking about digital food, right, you have permission to shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to give the last question to Bill Thompson of Click Fame, and I'm going to deny totally that I was ordering an Uber taxi for yeah. JP. <laughs> he said that on Twitter, right? I was tweeting. Uh, uh, would you like to give the, the, uh, this will be the last question because we've, we've got to finish, but Bill, what do you want to ask him? Just Thank you. Um, Thank you. It seems to me that, as a web scientist in Israel, quite a philosopher, you chose to describe the world because the point is to change it. And you are very much a participant observer in this. The decisions in your making, in your job, in your role, are the environment in which the web is evolving. So, what are the things that you are actually going to be doing to, make, to deliver on the things you just talked about? Where do you go next in your own career and with your own engagement? Okay, I, I, I've always found it easier to work with the minimum out trade between what I believe in my personal life and what I believe in my professional life. If I thought that uh, telecommunications wasn't important and that ubiquitous affordable connectivity wasn't important, I wouldn't have joined VT. If I thought the idea of cloud services and being able to avoid the waste of corporate data centers not being able to uh, trade their surplus capacity uh, wasn't important, I wouldn't have joined Salesforce. And if I thought there wasn't an, a need for us to be able to understand much more deeply the connection between how, you know, if you look at banking, it's an abstraction. Okay, uh, one of my colleagues over here said, well, you, you know, data comes in and data goes out. Okay, a credit card is now reduced to saying it's a set of numbers you remember. And you may not be numbers you remember, it may be a watch that you, you know, you sort of wash across something, but in the end, it's actually representative of a set of numbers that allows some movement to take place. Every one of these things uh, requires an understanding that the data that is created is true and that there is some measure of understanding why someone should consider it to be true and there is some protection, some you know, uh, watermarking, some prevention against the photoshopping of data that you know, probably immutability has been guaranteed some way and then moving that on to saying the ownership of data, customer data is the customer's data. You know, like I say when someone talks about spying, you know, there is a clue in the word. What do you think spies do? Right? In a similar way, customer data, there is a clue in the, word, in the phrase. Whose data do you think it is? So there are many things that larger institutions have a role to be able to play to influence this direction of saying, bring it back to trust and transparency, make sure that the, the, the conditions under which the data is generated is understood, make sure that the not, it's not just the provenance, but the ownership, because regulation exists in order to protect customers. Right? Reducing regulatory burdens is useful for everyone. Being able to do that in a way that we continue to build, right? uh, the, the level of collaboration that is needed. I don't want a situation where to, to prevent the solution of problem X, I create problem Y. You know, when DRM came up at its worst, I used to say, I do not want my daughter needing me to send her medical data while she is ill in Thailand and I can't do that because of the number of barriers, the way we have polluted the path to communication in order to protect Hollywood. Okay? Those sort of things were anathema to me. But it only works where there is, uh, you know, what Robin Chase refers to as like an and in her book, you know, that it's Piers Inc. Right? That large institutions have learned certain things. <coughs> Startups have learned certain things, you know. You can say whatever you like about Skype, but I want people to use Skype without any telephone company anywhere. You can say what you like about Salesforce, but I want anyone to be able to use that without there being a computer somewhere and software somewhere. 
So over-the-top services exist because infrastructure exists. Infrastructure needs certain skills to be able to build. We have lots to learn about how to manage monopolies, but that's why antitrust and monopoly commissions exist. And we will continue to learn about that. Taxation is a possible rule. But the way that we have to operate right now is to recognize that every industry without exception, every environment without exception, has this ability to be high touch, very analog at one edge, low touch, very digital at the other. And in between, there are many, many groups of people who have to resolve how they're going to work, not at either extreme, because you know, gray is where the, the world is. And collaboration to be able to solve these issues cannot happen unless we really spend time. And with that, I am thirsty and in need of a walk. Thank you very much for your time.
how the readers of its huge hands from the University of Southampton release its pent-up knowledge adventure. How are we going to do that? How are we going to change ourselves, uh, our organisation, our structures to be able to do that? So let's find some shit out of that as well. Uh, so will you join me in thanking uh, J.P. Rangaswamy for her uh, abstract work um, for a wonderful and very uh, inspiring talk. Thank you.